I, I specifically asked not to, and I was... <laughs> also, also, my name was misspelled on the session chair list, so maybe it's actually someone else who's supposed to be session chair, so um, if this person, mysterious person shows up, we'll see. But um, uh, yeah, my name is Chia Hao Chen, and I uh, currently work at Capital One, but uh, as of uh, beginning of last year, I was working at MIT, where uh, we were, I like to think, uh, you know, uh, willing and complicit in the adoption of Julia by MIT students uh, by forcing it on them, starting from version 0.0. 0. <laughs> 0. Um, and so um, this notebook dates back to some of the early days of Julia. So this, the very, very first version of this notebook was written for Julia 0. 0.2. And I'm very happy to say that it still works as of 0. 0.6. Uh, it doesn't work as of 0. 0.7 because Gadfly does not work on 0. 0.7 and this uses Gadfly quite heavily. Um, but this is an introduction to uh, parallel prefix uh, in the way it was taught uh, for several years at MIT in the parallel computing class. Um, so let me start with a show of hands. Like, how many people know what the parallel prefix algorithm is? Oh, great. So, so, so I guess some of that introduction will be helpful. How many of you have tried to do parallel computing in Julia? Oh, that was way more people. Oh, this is awesome. All right, all right. So, so we'll let, let's let's start with with uh, some higher order functions. Uh, so, so I'm sure most people in this audience have heard of map and reduce, uh, but uh, maybe not everyone knows that these are actually functions that take functions. And so, reduce is such a function built into Julia. So you can do a reduction over one to eight. Let's start with one to two because I think that's easier to to see. So you. You've created something that has one and two as the elements, and then you've asked to do a plus over all of that, and you get a number at the result. That's a reduction. Um, this is the same thing as asking for the sum. Uh, it's a different way of expressing it. But note, the interesting thing here is that you're using a function here, which is plus, as an input to another function, which here is reduced. Whereas sum here just says, do the sum. So um, of course, you can change this to other reductions. You can do factorials by doing multiplication. It's the same as asking for the consecutive product. Uh, you can do uh, very uh, uninteresting operations, like uh, define a function that gives me the left operand, and then use that to reduce, and then you get the left side. And then you have the right side, and then you get the right side. So a slightly less trivial example of this is Fibonacci numbers. Um, so uh, if, I feel like when I first saw this, I was just impressed at how like, matrices just showed up out of nowhere. Because if you write down the recurrence relation here, you can actually just extract the coefficients, and that's a matrix. And it turns out that this matrix has all sorts of wonderful properties which you can use to solve for uh, Fibonacci numbers. So the example I'm showing here is that the nth power of this recurrence matrix actually gives you the nth Fibonacci number in the anti-diagonal. And so you can just plug that in and do a multi matrix multiplication like that. And you can get Fibonacci numbers by reading off the off-diagonal element. And so indeed, if you run this, uh, you will see that you get some of the Fibonacci numbers you know, and probably the 100th Fibonacci number, which I will personally buy anyone a pint if they know exactly this number before they read it on the screen. No? All right. Go find me, go find me if, you, if you want to uh, dispute that. Uh, here's, a, here's a, another cute example where you can construct matrices using uh, reductions. So the result of a reduction um, is technically a scalar, but it may not be a scalar in the field that you're thinking about. Uh, so here you're doing a, uh, you're, you're defining a Hadamard matrix, which can, which can be defined as this recursive Kronecker product. So now you say, let's do Kronecker products on this matrix of one, 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 and minus one, and then you can start building these matrices. Um, those of you who do signal processing are probably very familiar with Hadamard matrices since they show up as certain kinds of signal transformations. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you can produce them, you can calculate them, and you can show that they are multiples of the identity if you do matrix times matrix transpose, you get the answer that you intended. Um, and I could go on and on like this, uh, but let me go on to prefix, which is the thing you've all come to hear about, uh, unless you just you know, lost and probably should be going to the other building, also possible. Um, so prefix is a slightly less trivial version of reduction, and the usual way prefix is introduced uh, looks like this. So suppose you're given a problem where you're asked to solve for the partial sums of, a, of an array. So for example, if you are given the matrix, the, the array of one, two, three, four, five, and then you want the first partial sum, second partial sum, third partial sum, 
which means to add the first element together, the first two elements together, and then the first three elements together um, to, to get the triangular numbers in this case. Um, this is how I think most people would write it. You would say, well, I can write it in this brute force way where I just write out every single matrix element and uh, array element and I add them up uh, to get the answer that I wanted. Then I realized that, oh, you know what, I'm, this is actually uh, grossly, grossly inefficient because I can just reuse the previous result. And so if you read this element and then this element and then this element, the last element on, on each line, you realize that everything else was basically the answer from the previous computation. So you can regroup things like this and then you say, well, I'm just, all I, can, all I need to do is just remember the previous result, which I already have because that's part of the answer that I wanted. And then I add the new element I want to it. So this looks great um, because it's a, it's a nice, simple algorithm. But um, you might now ask, um, how do you do this in parallel? But before we get to that, here's a very, very simple way to in introduce uh, the serial prefix uh, algorithm, which is probably nothing terribly interesting. But you can demonstrate that you can get triangular numbers, which which is kind of cute. Um, you can do factorials just by changing out plus two times. Um, you can do you can do max. Max probably does not do anything very interesting. Surprise, surprise. Um, now the interesting question is: Go back to this and ask: How do you do this in parallel? Uh, is anyone who doesn't know the parallel prefix algorithm want to guess how you would do this in parallel? Okay, it's it's after lunch. I don't blame you. Um, so, so the trick here is realizing that the addition operator here is associative, and you can group it however you want. So here we've grouped it in a very particular way to reuse the previous computation um, to get this, this form of the algorithm. But that's not the only way you can group plus together, because if you ignore things like floating point round off, uh, plus is associative, so, which means that I don't have to group it this way. I can group this addition and then this one, or I can group this addition and then this one. And so if you think about it then, if you're asking for like the general uh, nth solution for this problem, then you have actually many, many different ways you could regroup the addition operations together. And so one of the ways that you can, uh, you can regroup this um, is shown here. It's hard coded for length eight just because it's actually really nice to see the pattern here. So what you're looking for here is um, essentially two trees if you, look at, if you look at the indices. There's the odd numbers and then this, there's like multiples of four and then multiples of eight. And then there are these like somewhat strange numbers at the end here, uh, which nonetheless you can demonstrate. Please compute the, the answer that you expect, that you get the triangular numbers for this and the factorials for this. Um, and then this is what it looks like for general n. Uh, it's a bit messy, but because uh, there's like bookkeeping for powers of two. Uh, but I'll get back to this because most people, I think, uh, certainly for me, I have no idea what this, this code does if, un unless I sketch it out very, very slowly and carefully. Um, so when I was preparing this notebook for the very first time for Alan's class, um, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we just made the algorithm generate its own visualization? And so here's a little trick that I think is very nice to show in Julia, which first of all, um, it, I, think, I think most people here uh, either have seen this already or uh, will soon know that that uh, if you write something like a bracket one in, in, in Julia, that actually gets transformed into this function underneath, which is get index of a and then one. And then likewise, if you put this on the left-hand side of an equal sign, this gets transformed into a different function, which is set index. And so it says set index of a, y, and three. And now, uh, you can, these are just ordinary generic functions in Julia, which you can now redefine your own uh, definitions for. So what I've done here is create my own array type that does nothing but just track w what kind of reads and writes you, you put onto it. Uh, so I, I will skip through this, but this is just my, my custom array type, which I initially called fake array, but now it's called access array, because all it does is keep track of uh, the history of what you've done to it over here, and it actually doesn't contain any information. Um, you can actually you can actually put information in it, but it's just easier uh, for for this notebook to not. So get index is uh, and set index are changed. So get index here, instead of doing returning actually anything useful, it returns nothing. Uh, but instead, it tries to change its in internal state to keep track of the fact that you've asked for that particular uh, indexing operation. Similarly, for set index, um, it, it it doesn't actually save the data, but it just pushes onto the history what you've done to it before. And that's, um, that's the entire implementation of the tracing array. 
uh, now you can start doing uh, cute things where you pass it a, um, an array like looks like this, and you can say, well, I want an element eight prefix sum, and then you get nothing, which is maybe not that exciting. But you could also ask for now what all the state of this is. And so if you dump A, this now tells you every single read and write access that was ever done to this array. And now you have all the information you need to start doing visualizations. And this is where, this is where the part that doesn't work in point 0.7 is very sad because uh, it, it, was, it was actually really cool that this works. So you could uh, now, for every operation that you've done to this uh, array, define a visualization for it that just looks like that. So this is, these, are, these are all uh, graphical uh, primitives in, in Compose and Gadfly that just says, when you see an input gate draw a circle of this size, an output gate draws a circle of that size, and then the operations are lines, and then you just kind of composite all of that together. And so if you believe that that works, this is the render function, and that's what you get for, uh, for an element, uh, so array of size 20 on the plus operation. In the case, the operation doesn't matter, but just to show you that this um, is actually dynamically generated, this is of length three, and this is of length, um, maybe back quote three is not a real number, uh, 13, and so on and so forth. So, so the really fun part here is that you can start playing with the operations to figure out how does this, um, this algorithm change as a function of n. <coughs> And so um, if I dare, I might actually try to do this live. Uh, this is the other thing. Like the, the, if, if, you, if you've used Compose before, and, and I feel like probably at this point, that's a smaller and smaller group every year because Compose is, uh, is, is just not a, one of the standard plotting packages. But it's really cool to play with because you can, you can composite all these diagrams together. And you can look at the object diagram that is produced by the visualization and, and look at how it's done. Um, here you're visualizing the serial algorithm where you see the very classic cascade of operations happening here. So this is the part that I'm, I'm wondering will actually work here because manipulate, maybe we'll redraw uh, the, the, the trees like this. So, so it's kind of cute just to see how you can uh, change the visualization of this at real time. But uh, there's actually a more prosaic point to this, this, uh, this demonstration because there's something interesting that happens at powers of two and at three times multiple of two in this particular algorithm. And so this is what, this is what 15 looks like. And then 16, uh, if you notice, actually has an extra layer here. So at 16, you actually do an extra computation, which is uh, this particular element in the middle. And you need that to propagate all of this information to the rightmost register over here. What happens at, at multiple, three times multiples of two is actually um, also quite interesting. So let me try to find one. So if I look at 47, 48, 49. So you see, like, you can probably see what's going to happen here, right? Because you, you see at, at, at size 47, uh, you've kind of done all the uh, operations needed to get here. But if you go to the last one, to 48, you imagine if a new register, that now you need one more of these operations on the first line, and then that sort of generates a new cascade. And so that is exactly what happens. Uh, so you see that I, there's actually an introduction of a new stage uh, that is needed to propagate the information all the way to the right-hand side. And so I feel like this is something that I didn't know when I first looked at parallel prefix, that in this particular implementation of parallel prefix, uh, there's a growth in the complexity of the, of the calculation at powers of two and three times powers of two. Um, is, okay, this is, this is maybe not that interesting. This just shows that you can zoom in. Uh, all right. So, uh, so where this was really interesting here um, as, uh, as a computational tool now, not just a visualization tool, is to, is to demonstrate how uh, in, in Julia's uh, uh, future and promise system, uh, these, these things actually can be overloaded to do uh, the computation at the operator level. And this is, this is a, some people might say this is a somewhat old fashioned way of doing parallel computing, but I think it's really neat because it's in some sense, you're abstracting away the parallelism within the operator itself. And furthermore, uh, it, you, you actually can reuse the same implementation of parallel prefix that we used uh, to generate the, algorithm, the visualization itself. Because all of that was done in serial. Uh, there's nothing intrinsically parallel about it. It's just the way that the calculation was grouped to get the answers. But the only parallelism here actually comes in where you start defining 
the features that you need and says like when you want to do the addition of this future, you actually do it lazily where you then do the spawn to get the answer here. And so if you, um, if you turn this into a classic uh, strong scaling type calculation where you ask for the number of uh, processes that you want and just do matrix multiplication because uh, that hides a lot of the latent parallelism so that the, uh, the, the latency doesn't blow up your graph and you get a nice graph. This is, uh, this is the graph that you get. Uh, obviously not on this laptop because this scales out to 80 processors. Uh, this, was an, this was a machine that we had for, uh, for, that was like a fairly large memory beefy machine that we had at MIT. Um, and you see here that the, the, the staircase type structure, there's like kinks in the speed up ratio. And you can trace that exactly to the powers of two and three times the power of two that we talked about last time. So, um, yeah, some notes to say that benchmarking is hard. This became a paper that with Jared that I don't have time to talk about, but you can read. Uh, but I will actually just go straight to the last bit, which is um, around the time I was making this particular notebook, uh, there was some talk about how we don't have a type system in Julia. And it's like, oh, you know, you're misusing the word type, you're using, or misusing all these words that, uh, that these uh, programming language theory people love and, and, and so on. And one of the, the criticisms was that if you had a real type system, you could actually prove that programs were correct. And, uh, and, and we don't actually do any of that formal checking to prove that pro programs are correct when, when you compile uh, Julia programs, at least not in the usual sense that the compiler people mean it. Uh, but here's a very simple demonstration showing that um, there's nothing intrinsically limiting, limiting about the uh, type system in Julia. You can actually just uh, hijack the entire type system and multiple dispatch to do the formal verification here. So if you go back to the uh, very, very beginning, uh, this is terrible presentation practice, uh, but if we say, look at, uh, if you look at this, um, you, how, you could imagine that it's very easy to see from this program that is correct. That for, a, a, you know, if you're asked for the kth partial sum, uh, that you can just make sure that you've done all the additions you need to get there. And then for this, uh, for this form of the program, it's slightly harder, but it's also not that difficult. You can see that, well, for the second element, I've, I've traversed both elements, I've done two additions, and that's the correct answer. And so on and so forth. But for something that is more intricate like this, you might ask, how do you actually prove this is correct, that this actually does the additions in the way you want? And I think when, you, when, you, uh, when you're doing this for the first time, you start drawing these tree diagrams, uh, which are not that different from what I wrote here. Uh, you start drawing diagrams that look like this, and then now you have a diagram like this, and you can count and make sure that uh, by the time you've gotten to, from the, the, the first row all the way down to the last row, that you've done exactly all the operations you need for every single entry. But then this is sort of manual visual inspection. It's, it's not really that scalable. So the thing you can abstract out of this to turn this into a computer-based proof is to realize uh, that nothing has changed going from this version of the algorithm to like, the obvious version of the algorithm, which is this algorithm. Because what, what doesn't change? The fact that when you get to the, uh, the kth entry, you have to do exactly k minus one of these operations, and you have to touch every single one of these elements at least once. Sorry, once and exactly once. So, so that's the thing you can abstract away. So all you need to do is remember which part of the, the algorithm you've, uh, which part of the input array you've seen already, and how many of the operations you've done. And it turns out that that's all you need to prove the, that a program of this kind of program for a fixed length is correct. And so what you can do here is go back down here. Um, yeah, so um, somebody wrote a paper about this. So this was not really original. Um, it was uh, just a few months before I first wrote the first version of this notebook. Uh, and they had this very fancy name called the Interval of Summations Monoid Technique. All right, I said monoid once, so that's a, that's a legitimate talk, right? Uh, okay, so, uh, but here's, here's what happens here. So you, you, describe, you describe these two abstract types, and then this is the, this is the, the type of all possible outcomes here. So the, outcome, the all possible outcomes include these two abstract types, which I will talk about later, but also unit range. 
And so unit range is the thing that actually keeps track of all the previous accesses that you've done um, at, uh, for, for a particular element that you're looking at. And then this is, a, uh, this is an operator that uh, they've defined in the paper, but it's just, just another example of the uh, associative operators that you saw, like there was, it's just basically plus, it's plus with a circle, right? Uh, but all, all you have to do here is remember that um, this, this is where all the magic happens, right here. So, so when you do an operation on two unit ranges, you're checking if they are adjacent to each other. So, so I dot stop plus one, uh, that comparison is checking whether the end of the ith unit range uh, is directly next to the beginning of the jth unit range. And if that's true, then you return a new unit range with the old start and stop points uh, that covers both of the intervals. Otherwise, you return t, uh, which, is, which is top in this notation, but it's really bottom in, uh, in Julia's convention. Um, so, so in this case, t tells you that this, this top um, icon tells you that it's, it's like the wrong answer, like there's a fault. So this is the thing that generates the fault, and this is the success criterion. It actually t uh, keeps track of uh, the data that you've, you've seen before. And then there's an identity that you need to propagate uh, just to make sure that this is a closed algebra. So once you do this, you can actually show this is, uh, the fact that, that this cell just did nothing is actually a good thing because it, 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 is, it has just done the proof for program sizes up to length 1,000 that, the, that both the serial and parallel versions were correct. And so, and so that, that running this cell generates the proof. It's really that simple. So to show you something slightly, uh, slightly more interesting in terms of output, uh, you can create a wrong version where all I've done here is to just, um, just, off, just change the offset uh, in, in a way that is not correct. And all you have to do is run this and say, and say like, well, okay, there's some sort of type error that showed up. And, and so as far as the formal verification part of the, of the program is concerned, we're done. So all you needed to show was that this thing could run without an error and that would be a correct program. Any kind of error demonstrates a wrong program. And in this, in this case, it actually doesn't matter what the, the specific Julia error was. It just shows that this is wrong. And you can kind of see why it's wrong if you actually do the visualization. So uh, this was obviously not a very smart thing to do because you've added the third element to the second output. And so that obviously does not, uh, does not qualify as a correct implementation. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's cute to, to be able to see the answer uh, without uh, visual inspection. And you can see this is a really, really awful prefix sum. I do not recommend doing it this way. <laughs> All right, and so um, the, uh, the last part of this was actually showing that there's actually multiple forms of the prefix sum implementation, because as we've uh, talked about before, um, it doesn't matter how you regroup the operation. If the operation is associative, it will always produce the right answer for a correct implementation. And there are many, many ways you could have regrouped the operations. And so here's a different variant where you do this sum. Um, there is a problem with this rendering, so I'm going to skip over this because if you read this, this is obviously wrong. Uh, but there's also some of these other ones where, uh, where you, you read the algorithm, you implement it, and then you draw it out. And then I feel like I've seen this one before. Uh, this one's also kind of wrong, but, um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's actually kind of nice to be able to just do that, that kind of inspection and, and see that uh, you can start playing with the different access trees and regroupings. Uh, that's, that's really all I've prepared to, to say about parallel prefix. Uh, but suffice to say, like if anyone is using uh, any sort of uh, GPU-based operation that, that eventually some kernel is going to call parallel prefix, and this is something that that people uh, design very, very carefully to run specific on architectures, depending on like how many things you can send in parallel at the same time, and then there's considerations of how many operations you want to do at the same time to not saturate uh, the architecture you're running on, and so on and so forth. And so that is uh, that is parallel prefix. So you've seen parallel prefix, the s simple version. You've seen how you can uh, sort of almost trivially redefine how array access works in Julia to trick it into generating a visualization of the algorithm. And then the last bit here was uh, a very simple implementation of a formal proof system that uses Julia's type system. So I think that people should 
not t discount too seriously the fact that we actually have some sort of type system. So that is, that is it for me, and I know I ended early, but thank you all for being um, so on the ball immediately after lunch, because it's always hard. Thank you so much. You could, but uh, if you just want serial cum sum, then uh, the, the simple obvious thing is, is what you want. Funny you asked that because I think I drew a graph earlier. Uh, so that's, that's the speed up ratio you get for, for this particular version, yeah. Yeah, so this, this goes asymptotically as n over log n, uh, the speed up ratio. So it's one of those things where in the very early days of parallel computing, people looked at this and said, oh wow, parallel computing is really, really hard because the, you can't get order n speed up, you just get n over log n. Uh, they took this as a very typical kind of operation. Yeah. So these days people get a lot fancier. arbitrary n. Um, I've thought about how you might do that. Yeah, so, so, the, so the question was whether I could just uh, prove the correctness of the program for all n. Uh, and it's something that I thought about. Um, the thing I, I'm stuck on, and maybe this is just me not thinking about it long enough, is, is proving that it, there's, there's some sort of recurrence in, in the actual formal proof, right? Because when you get to the k minus 1 element, uh, if, you, if everything is correct up to that point, then that information gets propagated to some of the future elements further down the chain because of the structure of the computation. Uh, and, and I think you saw that because as, when you do the visualization, you're just zooming in and out um, effectively when you look at the visualization. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the right answer is, and I, I, feel, I have a feeling that it might not actually be the n minus one case you look at, but you have to kind of jump back uh, to like the last complete subset and then like add the elements in separately. So I think that's why it's not so trivial uh, for arbitrary n. And one thing to, 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 to mention also is that usually people present only the powers of two version of this algorithm because it's easier to analyze. Yeah, so, th so that's my thought right now. I don't, I don't really know the answer. Yes? Yes, um, I think Alan's class is available. Um, some ver earlier versions of this notebook are definitely oh, yeah, there. Uh, oh, great. So, I, I will have to confess that uh, uh, I have to give Shashi a lot of credit for, for interact.jl, and it's now almost an annual uh, Julia Khan tradition where it doesn't work the day of the presentation and I have to go find Shashi and say, Shashi, please fix this for me. <laughs> uh, so, so thank you, Shashi, if you're here. He's probably talking uh, at a different session, but yeah, he's, he's the guy who made interact.jl. It's a very, very simple but very effective tool for, for doing teaching, as we found. Any other questions? Next thing. Yeah, there's a, that's a good question. So the question was like, can you somehow generalize this to generate arbitrary visualizations? Uh, I think that's an, the first question, I think, is always like, what do you want out of the visualization? So this particular visualiz visualization was meant to teach. It was meant to illustrate how the, 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 the thing worked. Uh, and so there is a very, there's a simplification here because it's, it's one dimensional and there's, you know, there's no, there's no like, um, particularly difficult structure to look at when you look at, like, um, you know, there's no gaps and, and things like that. So I think for the arbitrary case, it, it could get complicated very quickly. And if you did this 
if you use this to visualize matrix multiplication, I don't think you get like a very interesting pattern, right? Because you just see like everything is crossed with everything else. So I'm not, um, it's, it's not clear what you want in the general case, or at least it's not clear to me what you want in the general case. But certainly the trick of just overloading set index and get index, I feel like it's, it's not that hard. Um, it is not as user friendly as I would like because you have to create this like big array type. Um, and I'm not sure how you would be able to, to generalize that uh, in a way that's transparent to the user, right? So I guess you could like wrap a macro around things and say like whenever you see an array access, like convert it to an access array and then actually propagate the data underneath so that whatever access pattern you get from the computation is correctly captured. Yeah. Yes? Check for what, sorry? Race conditions. Yeah, so the question was uh, whether you can use this to check for race conditions. Um, not in this current version. Uh, so I think parallel debugging is in general an extremely hard problem. So what, one, one, one extension you could imagine here is to uh, simply record the timestamp uh, of whatever happened on the master node. Uh, but then that itself is prone to a race condition. Right, so, so I, I, I think without, without a guaranteed uh, unique resolution clock, I think it's very hard to prove that something like that would be free of race conditions, but you could certainly use the timestamps if you collected it and kept track of where it came from and what time it ha happened, that uh, you would imagine some sort of serialization that would happen, right? So you wanna make sure that operations that start should start when they should and not before other operations that finish, right? So that's the, that, that would be how you would look at the race condition, I think. Yeah, but there's no guarantee that the clock running on every process in a distributed system is even set to the same correct time. Um, so so that's, a, that's a bit more of a challenge, I think. Yeah. Well, you can find me um, after the talk. Thank you all so much. Uh, I am also my own session chair, so I am at the, what, how many minute mark here? Yeah, thank you.